Um, you know, flat earth seems to be everywhere in the news today. I mean, the behind the curve documentary, um, Joe Rogan, uh, speaks about it a bunch. Um, and Eddie Bravo, right. Um, uh, you know, they talk a lot about it. So, you know, for, for folks who are new to the flat earth theory, how would you summarize the flat earth theory? Okay. So the flat earth theory basically states that you are not on this little tiny globe rock flying through space at five different velocities. You don't live in this vast, endless universe that's mostly empty. You are living in a structure, a terrarium, a planetarium, uh, a soundstage, a building that is so large that even our best and brightest didn't figure it out until about 1960. And what they figured out was is that, again, it was this large building with a lake inside it, a giant saltwater lake. And inside that lake were various islands that we call continents. And that it was made by something much larger and much more powerful than ourselves. And they decided to keep a secret for the last 50, 60 years. And uh, we only now, only recently, since about 2015, has the technology of the general public caught up to where our detection abilities can now figure out that, yeah, what we used to think was a globe just isn't a globe anymore. The, the most obvious of which is that there's no detectable curve whatsoever, even though you hear about it and see it in the icons every day. Now, what do you think is the most compelling um, evidence for to support the platter theory? The most compelling evidence is probably the one that's the most widespread. And by that, I mean the um, long distance photography. That's probably the most telling, which is, and I didn't even bring this up in the clues, which was people going to the beach with high powered HD cameras with digital zoom. And again, 10 years ago, if somebody was said, oh yeah, that sailboat's going over the horizon, I would have been right there with you and said, oh yeah, it's absolutely going over the horizon. Can't you see it? You know, I'm pretty sure I can see the mast going off into the distance. And only now with HD technology, can we zoom in and that boat isn't going over the horizon anymore. It just pops right back into frame. And we can keep doing this again and again. Uh, and you're saying, okay, what's the point? My point is, is that if the curvature of the earth is eight inches per mile squared, that means eventually that boat has to go behind the curve. And it doesn't uh, to where we're shooting at such long distances. The only limitation we have right now is the thickness of the atmosphere itself to where I challenge anyone in science. Show me an object at like less than 150 miles, whether it be a lighthouse or a building or an island or whatever that we can't see. You know, because eventually, you know, these, this object has to be behind the curve and people will say, oh, well, it's because it's a mirage. Like, no, nah, no, nah. mirages don't, pers one, mirages don't act like that. They certainly don't persist through all light conditions, all distance, uh, weather, light, you know, up to, up and including darkness. Uh, and also mirages can't be targeted by weapon systems and they don't show up on infrared and we see all those things. So that, yeah, that's probably the most compelling thing is long distance photography. Now, how did you how did you get into this? I know your mother was a nurse. Uh, were you always curious as a child? Um, you know, how did you how did you stumble upon or get into the flat Earth? Uh, I got theory? into I got into flat Earth because I was bored. <laughs> That's really the I, I think a lot of people kind of get into it like that. And that is, I'm I'm old enough that there was a commercial out some years ago, back when you could finish the internet, which was kind of the running joke. It's like finish the internet, like you're finishing you know a, a, a long book. And I had, I had looked through so many topics on the internet. Everybody knows about Flat Earth. Everybody hates it. It's, it's a silly thing to look at. And in fact, I refuse to look at it like a lot of people. And then one day I said, eh, fine, I'll just look at it. But you know, can say I did it, right? It's like watching a television show or at least a, a couple episodes. It's like, okay, I'll see what this thing's about. And I thought I should be able to debunk this thing in a few um a few days and it was the opposite uh, i sat on this thing for nine months and did every sort of creative problem solving technique i could ever think of on it to where finally at the beginning of 2015 i said okay i'm gonna go the other way on this and i created a series of videos called the flat earth clues and put it out on the internet and basically was a challenge to the hive mind of, of the internet because the internet knows everything eventually you'll you'll find an answer to whatever it is and I said, I go, I can't prove the, the globe in a court of law anymore. Tell me where I'm wrong. Cause I think it's flat. 
Uh, it sounds crazy, but I, I think we're living in a flat enclosed world, like a, like a snow globe. And almost immediately people started contacting me and saying, you know what, you may be onto something. So there are like three groups of people. One, there were people that were just fascinated with it. Uh, a second group would have been the, the, the subject matter experts that called, you know, called up and said, you know what, we, we don't use the Coriolis effect, the spinning of the earth. We don't use the curvature of the earth. And then the third group was the media because yeah, for, for them, it was brand new, you know, novelty rules the universe. And this was something, even though it's a very, very old topic, it was something that's never been covered in a modern sense. And so media started saying, you know what, this is like, they were treating it like it was new news. And so there was just this wave of, of media that just kept that wanting to poke into this. And uh, yeah, so that's how it evolved. Would you say, I mean, the flatter theory community obviously is growing strong. I know there are conferences. I know you just attended the Question Everything conference. Right. Um, do you think that the internet, what's, what's changed now? Is it, is it social media? Is it, you know, communication technology? What, what do you think is behind this growing community? The biggest reason why the, this thing is grown, well, okay, it's, it's, it's two parts. One is the grassroots side of it, which is people like me just getting into it, hating flat earth, and then trying to disprove it. Everybody, the t-shirt reads, I got into flat earth because I tried to debunk flat earth. That part, that, that part has always been organic and has always been growing. Uh, but then we had these weird media milestones, which I, I was kind of talking about in my speeches this year, which is they, uh, First off, there was uh, the the Grammy nominated uh, rap artist B.O.B. who made a video. And, I'm sorry, a, a track and an album for Flat Earth, and he made a specific track against Neil deGrasse Tyson, the world's most popular physicist, which was really weird. the The combination of the two was was just flammable in the in the media world to where they just latched onto it. And then that was all of 2016, and then all of 2017, you had one of the the best basketball players in the world. Uh, Kyrie Irving from the uh, uh, Cleveland Cavaliers, he went on about it in a podcast, said, oh yeah, it's absolutely flat. And then LeBron James, because they were both so um, uh, still glowy from the whole championship thing, LeBron James backed him. And that right there carried all of 2017. And these are huge media things where, where people just love this story. So Flat Earth was being combined with a lot of stuff, whether it be music or science or sports. And then, uh, you know, a few entertainers here and there, you know, as a smattering and, you know, throw in Mad Mike Hughes for good reason or, or for added measure. And that's that's where it took off to where now, you know, 2019, we've got conferences in multiple countries. We've got reached hundreds of regional meetups at this point. Uh, the numbers got so big that YouTube tore down its own scoreboard and uh, it's all been happening again with almost no resources on our part. We did every all of this in four years with uh, almost no financial backing whatsoever. That's amazing. I know your YouTube your YouTube channel alone has, I think, what, 70 over 75,000 subscribers? Something like that, um, that's yeah. That's a pretty big platform. That's a big platform, Mark. I mean, um, I, I imagine, I know I've, in your content, you answer a lot of Q&A uh, from emails. Yeah. I mean, how many how many contacts do you get a week uh, from people? I don't even know. Uh, the Here's where it gets weird. I mean, yeah, I get a ton of emails. I get quite a few texts, even though I don't answer texts and yeah, the phone, you know, there's calls all the time. Uh, but what was interesting was, and I know we'll probably talk to it about it in a second was when the Netflix, uh, thing finally, the Netflix version of behind the curve documentary hit my email load doubled in, in a week to where it's like, I'll, I'll never be able to catch up now. I was just barely hanging on. Uh, but yeah, I, I love the fact that people write me on a regular basis and I, I answer as many as I can in Q and a, uh, and some, of course I can't answer cause they're too long and, and some, uh, I don't answer a lot of troll emails, although I don't get very many, but anyway, so yeah, the call load's big. I don't know the numbers to be honest. It's, it's staggering at this point. Shouldn't be, remember it's flat earth should be ridiculous. Nobody should be talking about this. And yet every, every hour I get tons and tons of emails. You know, let's talk about the Behind the Curve documentary. Um, I did see it, um, and you know, it's and Netflix obviously is a huge platform, so that's a pretty big reach. The fact that they actually did, I know it's not. Um, when did they actually shoot Behind the Curve? It's a couple years ago. Oh yeah, I yeah. Think. It's it's actually yeah. almost it's almost two years old when they when they first started shooting this. This was a snapshot of 2017, uh, and that's pretty standard for. Actually, we got it out sooner than than even they thought it was going to happen because documentaries take a long time. To, to reach it to the general public normally. 
So they first reached out to me in uh, April of, of 2017. And then we uh, we started kind of figuring out what we we're going to do in May. And then next thing you know, we, you know, they just followed us around. They followed myself and Patricia and Bob and Jaron and um, Nathan and Chris. And, you know, they went all around the country on a shoestring budget, you know, stay, stayed in Airbnbs most of the time. And then they went down to the conference in Raleigh in November. And then they uh, took them about three months to edit it. And it premiered April of 2018 in the Toronto Film Festival, which I had, I had the pleasure of going. So I was one of the first people to see it. And because what, what they usually do, if you haven't sold it to a studio right away, what they do is they put it in the film festival circuit to try to get credibility. But that's still kind of dicey. Like the Toronto Film Festival, there were 3,000 applications. They only took 100 films. And we made it into that 100 films, which was amazing. And then out of that, we were always making the, we didn't win awards, but it was like, oh, the top 10 films you must watch, which is weird. You know, not, we we're always in that list, but we, it didn't win any awards. Well, it probably shouldn't because it's flat earth. And then uh, during that process, you look for a buyer and they were saying, oh yeah, you know, it may take us over a year to, to sell this thing. No, they sold it quickly. And then it was released on, in November, it was released uh, yeah, on Google, oh, I have the freaking list right here, on iTunes, Prime Video, YouTube, and Google Play. And Netflix was the last one. They were the last holdout for whatever reason. I, again, I don't know who it was sold to. And then uh, just, a, what, a week, a week and a half ago, it released on Netflix, and I had no idea. I severely underestimated the Netflix mar market share because those first four, and they're not slouches. I mean, iTunes, big company. Google, big company. YouTube, you know, part of a big company. And when Netflix came out, the whole thing just exploded. And so now it's, it's everywhere. I, I didn't realize everybody had Netflix. Go figure. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> shifting gears a little bit. Um, so the comedian and public speaker, Owen Benjamin, he's very vocal about his thoughts on the moon landing being a hoax. Right. Uh, Joe Rogan used to speak about this a bunch. Um, you know, uh, so if the Earth is flat, I mean, is space travel real? What are your thoughts? No, good Lord, no, no. As a matter of fact, it's way worse than that. Uh, what I'm saying is not only is the... Uh, the Apollo program was completely fabricated from, from minute one. And I get why they did it. You had to fake space. It wasn't that, that they wanted to. Uh, because you had to keep the general public away from space. You had to keep the private companies away from space. You had to militarize space. And by the way, they say, well, you know, why, why are you saying that space is fake? It's like, okay, well, think of where you get all your information from when it comes to space. It comes from the United States military or other space agencies, which are blueprinted off the United States military and or the Soviets. When you look up in the sky right now, anybody out there, they see what we are told are planets and stars and all these other fun things. And I say, hey, I don't see that. I see lights. That's what I see. I just see pretty little lights. And the reason I say that is because when you go to a planetarium, they can replicate all these things on the ceiling very, very easily with technology we've had since the 70s. And that's just the bad version of it, you know, but, they, but it's pretty good, you know, and imagine what you could do with a lot of resources and a lot of time. Imagine what we could do in a hundred years or a thousand years. Can't remember, we didn't even have te HD television 20 years ago. Oh, it's, I mean, yeah, technology, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, well, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I don't know, you, you probably have seen the Truman Show, right? Because <laughs> sometimes when I think of the way you describe the flat earth theory or you know, the, the dome, it reminds me of the Truman Show. Do you, was that sort of a Hollywood kind of wink, wink? Hey, <laughs> you know, uh, I, what, do you, what are I, your thoughts on that? I don't, th I don't know if it was. I mean, you know, this sort of thing. Uh, it, you know, if you're trying to hide the world like this, yeah, we're talking about a multi-decade plan. It's not something you just whip up in a couple of years. And the 1998, 1998 movie, The Truman Show, was very telling in that aspect, and it really did get me thinking because. Truthfully, I mean, when you're watching that show, the only reason Truman found out was because of production mistakes. And I mean, they were really overt production mistakes, things they would have nailed down a long time ago. In truth, Truman would have lived his entire life and died never known. I mean, that's the whole point of this. And, and if you spend that much money on it, you're not going to make mistakes. But the plot line, you know, demanded it. And uh, but yeah, it was something that absolutely was feasible. By, by that, I mean, you create a 20 mile wide stadium and you control the, the weather and the lighting and everything. And you, again, we believe, there's a line, very telling line in there, and that is we believe the world that is presented to us. But the movie that really struck me, which a lot of people didn't watch, was The Village by M. Night Shyamalan, 
which talked about uh, a group of wealthy individuals who bought a wildlife preserve and decided to build an Amish town in the middle of it and then raise kids and tell the kids they were living in the early 1800s in the middle of a, of a forest that was surrounded by potential threats. And so they couldn't venture out. What I found out really what was really fascinating about that movie was when those older people, if you would have taken that movie forward in like 20, 30 years, as those older people passed away, the kids growing up in there, they're not living a lie anymore. They absolutely are living what they are told. They believe the world is presented to them. There is no deception in that entire world. And they could pass that on from generation to generation. I thought it was fascinating. And again, they did that without a stadium and without really any technology. So again, we, we believe what we're told. We believe, you know, we take things at face value. And uh, I, I find it fascinating. You know, yeah, that, and that actually is, a, that is very fascinating. I did not think of that. Um, I love M.I. Shyamalan's movies, and that's, that is a great one. I mean, do, do you feel there is, with, with you know, if, if, the, if the, the earth is flat, a controlled, you know, it's a, it's a controlled, I almost want to say a simulation, is there overlap with, the simulation theory somewhat? I mean, I know yeah. simulation theory is more like a digital simulation, but what are your thoughts on here's, the two? Yeah, here's the thing. And I would me. love to say, I would love to tell everybody, I would I would love to make videos and actually say, okay, here's how it's a simulation. Because I do believe in simulation theory, I absolutely do. Because I grew up and was trained and um, the industry that I worked in dealt with simulations. Look, I played video games for a living. Uh, I worked with video game companies and what I knew what the cutting edge was and what they wanted to do in the future. And here's the thing, anyone, and I, it, but it's so heady, it's so thick, it's so cerebral that I don't like bringing it up to people because it, I mean, flat earth bends their mind uh, as it is, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell it to you real quick, which is this, and anyone has any doubt, look up something called the double slit experiment. And no, I don't mean the old version. I mean, the newer versions going up into the 2000s. And the double slit experiment says that matter doesn't materialize until someone is looking at it. And now, let me let me clarify here. What I mean that by that is if you're in a video game, everyone knows we've all seen video games and a character is walking down a road, right? And you see a mountain off in the distance. If the character is never going to be on the other side of that mountain, do you draw the other side of the mountain? No, you do not. Why? Conserve resources. That's it. You know, save computer power. That's all the reason you do it. It's, it's just an efficient way of building the game, right? And we do that in just about every game you can think of. On top of that, we also build our simulations completely flat because no one's looking for the curve and the curve would be so gradual, the character would never notice it. So you just make everything on a flat grid. In fact, it's a flat enclosed building is how we make the simulations uh, because it's easier. It's just more efficient. It's, and machines don't like thinking in curves, which is weird to say, but it's true. Computers do not like curves. Uh, that's why we make pixels. Pixels are squares. Oh yeah, you can make pixels small enough that you can draw a curve to the naked eye, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But when you zoom in, it's squares. Here's where it gets weird. That whole thing where we don't draw something unless unless we're over there to deserve it. We don't draw the other side of the mountain. We don't draw the other side of the town, blah, blah, blah. We see that in real life. That's what the double slit experiment is. And any I challenge any scientist to, to debate that with me, which is basically when you're not looking at something, it doesn't materialize at the atomic level that's and and if, so why is that happening here because we that's what we do in simulations we do that exact same thing and this is straight out of the plot of the 13th floor if you guys are trying to figure out where you think it's familiar which is we we started building simulations and then all of a sudden when we finally figured you know the people inside the simulation figured out it was a simulation the same time we figured out we were in one so yeah uh everything that it everything screams at an atomic level in this world right now that we're living in screams that we are in some sort of simulation but we think it, we we try to downplay it and say you know that that it's oh it, it cheapens our existence it's like no 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 god's a programmer that's what i'm saying you know before we had power tools god apparently just used a magic hammer and chisel right and then when we you know we got more advanced god got more advanced to where now you know we're making code it's like what you think we just invented code come on People, individuals and beings created technologies that are far beyond what we have now. So yeah, simulation, absolutely, you know, at, at the highest level, but the average person on the street doesn't like to, it, it, it's so tough to explain simulation and software development to people on the street that it's, there's no point in even trying. So I start with something very, very simple, which is it's flat, it's flat, it's enclosed. That's all you need to know for now. Very, very fascinating. You know, you mentioned God. You know, what are your what are your thoughts on religion? Well, 
look, I was raised, you know, born again Christian and where church wasn't just a Sunday thing. You know, I would go to a vacation Bible school in Camp Malibu and so on and so on. And when uh, I would, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for one second, which was God is uh, this world. Okay. For, for example, uh, I like to say that, that flat earth kind of will eventually kill atheism because what I mean by that is the default shape of the world, if you believe it's flat and enclosed, well, then it can't be anything but built, right? It was created, it was built. At that point, you're kind of split in hairs. What built this place, right? Is it an advanced civilization or is it the divine? Because one man's advanced tech civilization is another man's deity. I mean, come on, if a, if a giant golden spaceship came down and landed in Africa somewhere, uh, there would be people, you know, bowing immediately and there'd be other people saying that, well, it's a technological marvel. So which one's right? Uh, you know, and I'm not saying so the the kind of the joke I throw at people is, uh, you know, did God build this place or did he subcontract out the work? And if it's the latter, you know, if it is an advanced civilization, at the very least, uh, they're uh, they're one level closer to having God's phone number than we are. You know, that's, um, it's, it's very fascinating. So many other questions to go from here. Um, now, like, are people, are there folks, are, are, are there people who are in on it? Like, are they, because obviously this, this is a conspiracy. Oh yeah, it's human beings. Us, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like of course, there's, there's human beings that know about this. Absolutely. But not nearly as many as debunkers would like to think. You know, people said, you're talking about every scientist and every pilot and every NASA employee. And I'm going, no, I'm talking about no scientists and no employees of, of anything, really. I mean, you'd need almost no one to keep this a secret by comparison you know a very very small percentage of people i uh, used the uh, the movie capricorn one as a, as a great one which is capricorn one was a late 70s movie about a fake mars program and the only people that were in on it other than the top top brass were the telemetry guys the the software guys that would do the data transfer because you had to transmit fake data you had to transmit fake coordinates and that was a very uh uh, telling thing for me. So yeah, I mean, everybody, 99% of the people that work at NASA, I'm sure are completely legit. They turn wrenches, they build fuel systems, they polish capsules, they do HR, they work in the cafeteria. Everyone's fine. Uh, it's only the telemetry guys that would need to know. Most scientists, they wouldn't need to know. I mean, I don't even know the president of the United States is, is in on it because you'd want as many people to act naturally as possible. Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah, he may know that something's wrong, but they're not going to have to tell him everything. I treat it no differently than I would um, spies, you know, with compart compartmentalization, which is, you know, you hire a spy, he goes out and he shoots somebody. That's what a spy does in, in some cases, or gets reconnaissance, right? But we'll say the shooting part, because that's more fun. And he goes out and he shoots somebody. He's not told why he's shooting them. He doesn't know the political motivations. He doesn't know all the, all the details about this target. He just knows he's supposed to do a job, plain and simple. And same thing with, with this, you know, even the astronauts nowadays, I think they're told they're, they're supposed to fake stuff, but they don't know why they're faking it because the less they know, the better, uh, kind of a need to know, uh, you don't want that weighing on, on someone's conscience, which is why I pointed the Apollo astronauts and say that they, uh, they were probably told at one point, cause this was early in the sixties. We didn't know any better. Uh, again, I remember in the 1950s, we we're telling people uh, how you get rid of used motor oil is, is put some gravel in your, a spot of gravel in your lawn and pour it. <laughs> Seriously, it's that's in popular science. So in the 60s, I, I think they told the astronauts to, uh, you know, what was going on and it weighed on them because these guys became recluses. They drank uh, and they just didn't talk to the public very much. And there's still five of them around now. And you'd think they'd, they'd be even do, being more public speaking, but they're not. So anyway. Now, do you think that, I mean, this flat earth um, is, um, you know, what's, what do you think is the motivation behind it? Is it, is it an experiment? Is it, so there is some sort of, you know, and who, who do you think that they are? I mean, a, a rich elite? I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts on who's well, behind this? I mean, there's so many d secret societies. What I do love about secret, secret societies in the world is that they're, they're so ethereal in nature that if you gave anybody you know write down your top 10 in order of importance uh groups in this world that are the you know, secret societies that are running the world everyone will come up with different lists you know is it the bilderbergs is it the rothschilds is it the vatican is it some sort of jewish cabal is it the masons it's so on and so on and so on 
Um, what I the first rule has never changed in the in the rule of, first rule of power, and that is stay hidden. And by that I mean the true people in power you're never going to know about, and there's a very specific reason for that, and that is you can't make yourself you don't want to make yourself a target for the masses. You can't be overthrown if they don't know who you are. So the people that put kings in power, that put presidents in power, uh, anybody, you know, it is, in fact, it's probably the curse of true power, which is you can't be famous and also be all powerful in, in, in you know, the, the, the power structure because you, the, you would get found out. People will find you. And it, but if they don't know you're a target, they can't. So you're kind of the, the puppeteer behind the scenes. So. Are there super rich people that we don't know about? Are there super, I don't know if there are people with special powers or anything like that, but definitely ultra wealthy. No, no question. I mean, are there internal struggles like, you know, between you know, the Rothschilds and the Masons or the Bilderberg or the Trilateral Commission or who knows? That's just it. You, you don't know for sure. All I know is the, the people at the very, very top, they're not giving it away. It's, it's the first rule. You don't break it if, un, unless you, uh, unless you have special powers. I don't think you can break it. Yeah, it's you're right. I mean, it, it actually made me think of um, as you're talking through the different conspiracy theories, or I should say the you know secret societies. Right. Um, I'm kind of fascinated with that as well. Um, I did a deep dive on David Icke. I'm sure you're familiar with David. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and the rept in the reptilian theory. I know he's kind of shifted his focus a little bit, but he was. Uh, well, we can. I'm, I'm just curious if, he, if if that the reptilian theory, the essence of that, somehow plays sort of you know non-humanoid. Um, you know, maybe there's not humanoid society that's behind it. I don't know. I'm just, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I don't really think about it that much. People ask me about all sorts of conspiracies. And I mean, yeah, I've got an opinion on just about every conspiracy you can think of. But for me, because they're all below the whole flat earth umbrella, for lack of a better term, uh, I just don't have time. It's like, yeah, fine. You know, I mean, seriously, I could rattle off 20 different conspiracies for you, but for me, they're all secondary. They're all second shelf compared to that. I mean, yeah, could there be, uh, you know, other races? Sure, why not? As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd half expect that because with a building like this, it would not be a one-off, meaning, we, you know, we're not the first people to rent this apartment by any stretch. So there are there remnants of older civilizations rolling around and, you know, both living, you know, not just the, the artifacts, but the actual individuals. Yeah, sure. I mean, look at the sunken cities off of Japan, the sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, the real pyramids, Bimini Road, and so on and so on. I mean, there's all sorts of things here indicating that this was a sandbox that gets changed up every once in a while. And uh, who knows, you know, what, what happens, you know, what, what civilization was living here when we had a supercontinent in the middle, when we had Pangaea, and what terraforming, you know, has happened since then, you know, wh what were the stages? I don't even know what version of this you know we are in. Are we on the sixth? Are we in the seventh? The twenty seventh? Hard to say. Yeah, I've heard you say that once before that there may be other domes. We may just be of one. Oh yeah, well yeah, not just yeah, not well not just that. Yeah, not only are we the only not only the only people that have used this particular place, but yeah, why wouldn't you have other domes and other stages of development? Uh, there's all sorts of fun you could have with this thing. Now, um, you know, you're obviously dialed in uh, to the community. Um, and I'd say you're probably the one of the strongest voices in the flat Earth community. Mm -hmm. What are what are the what are the what are our research activities? What's going on um, within that community to try to you know prove the flat Earth theory? Uh, right now, the same same sort of stuff. I mean, everybody's still the exploratory phase, so everybody's doing long distance. It starts off with the easiest stuff first: long distance photography, then laser experiments. Uh, various physics experiments that people are doing. Uh, people talk about explorations and things like that, but that never seems to get off the ground, mostly because of finances. It just costs so much to do. Uh, other than that, not not too much. I mean, you know, some 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 again some things on planes. That's that's been kind of one of the trends recently. And then whatever else people can come up with. I mean, it's they're reimagining things all the time uh but not is in fact wait isn't there a force the level i you'll have to forgive me i don't have all of them memorized but i think there's a force level experiment that's happening pretty soon but i don't know who's on it uh but anyway they're out there all the time now climate change or global warming i guess we can put the word global to the side you know do you mm. is climate change real is it is it part of this 
I believe it's real. It yeah. 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 I, I do. But I don't think it's it's what people think it is. Meaning, OK, first off, climate change is way more efficient and it absolutely can happen if uh, you if you have an enclosed system. Meaning if it's a if it's a if it's a flat enclosed world like a sports stadium, it, come on, it makes sense. And that is you're talking about an atmosphere that's contained. Therefore, if you do anything in there and by that, it's not just human interaction. You know, we have what seven billion people and how many internal combustion engines running at all time, which would generate some energy transfer issues. But also human beings trying to manipulate the weather would also do that. So if you do have like a heart program or whatever, you look, the military, it's no secret. The military's always wanted to control the weather. It is the perfect weapon in that it cannot be blamed on anybody. You know, when a, a tornado touches down in your city, it's not like it's got a flag, you know, attached to it. So it's like, oh, just an act of God. Well, if you can manufacture acts of God, that that would really be your benefit the problem is is when you do that you are manipulating energy and you're you know because weather is just energy it's just heat transfer and when you do that uh, you run the risk of a, an automated system like this or a partially automated system to compensate in some way which is why i think it was changed from global warming to to climate change uh even though it seems like there is a, a heat issue and of course that would again would make sense because of all the furnaces we have running at all times but yeah uh, I think it's real. I don't think it's just because of civilian population. I also think it's be happening because of the backlash from military operations. Now you mentioned the military. Now, um, has, have there, has, I, I, much, I don't know the answer to this question, since so I'm asking it, but um, you know, has there been a um, any sort of research pro exploration projects? I mean, can can you, if we had enough money, can we, you know, without military intervention, actually go to the ends? I yeah. don't. I don't believe so. Uh, I don't. I'm meaning the North Pole and the Outer Rim seem to be off limits. I mean, the Antarctic Treaty is no joke. It's something I just stumbled across back in uh, 2014 when I was looking at this thing, which was, you know, the Antarctic Treaty. On no nation, no corporation on any place can even can even talk about it, which is amazing. They can't set up a shop in Antarctica, and it's it's locked down. It's air it's airtight. Um, yeah, scientists can go down there every once in a while, and the military's down there. Uh, but you cannot run amok. You just can't do it. And the North Pole also may be in that same boat, although it's much, much smaller. So does that kind of answer it? Kind of? It, it does. Yeah, okay. it does. Well, Mark, I really appreciate your time. Just a few more questions and we sure. can wrap up. Um, sure, sure. So what is, what is, what's, what's coming up in this year? What do you have, what do you have going on? I know there's a conference in New Zealand, I think. Or yeah. What do you have going on this year as far as. So we just did the LA conference and then they're talking about a conference in Canada, even though the Toronto conference was scrapped because we just had too many things going on with the, with the people that were producing that. Uh, the New Zealand one's next. That's the end of April. Uh, there's a big meetup, I think, down in San Francisco, which I may go, but it's probably not going to happen until after New Zealand. Then there is the London conference. There is Amsterdam. And then, of course, the big conference in the United States in Dallas. That'll round out the year. And that's just the, the conferences. Uh, as far as meetups and everything else, I mean, I've been asked to do all sorts of weird stuff, like a commencement address for a university in Indiana. And there's a whole bunch of high schools that want me to talk. I mean, there's one high school that actually in Chicago wants me to come out and, and address the high school. I'm going, boy, I don't know if you're going to get past that by the administration, but you might. Who knows? I mean, pfft, weirder things have happened. So for me, it's it's mostly you know spreading the word as, as much as I can, doing as um, many um, interviews and speaking appearances as I can, and, and just saying, hey, look, take a look at it, take a look at it, and, and getting the word out, and of course promoting the film, even though the Flat Earth community is is got huge problems with the film and the media is, loves to hate it, uh, it still puts the seed in a lot of people's heads. Yeah, back to the film. I mean, how do you think? Um, I think you said once on your YouTube channel that. Uh, you're a bit disappointed with how the flat earthers were portrayed in the documentary. How how do you think they were? Was it fair? Well, uh, it, it was it was a, of the flat earthers. It, it was fair, but then you know, you never find out all the details. Uh, what, what's the old saying? And that is, nothing is completely what it first appears to be. And I didn't realize until I was listening to the director's commentary on the iTunes version of it that the director you know it was supposed to be a human interest piece that was you know and you know, all these f funny flat earthers and and it was supposed to, you know they're harmless they're not doing anything wrong and and uh, they don't pose any threat to society and then the next thing you know uh he mentions which was interesting because i've heard this multiple times now from different people that once he got to the raleigh conference and that 12 year old kid asked me a question when i was up on stage and then asked for my autograph later and all this other stuff 
he it, he said that it went too far. And, you know, it's, it's that old thing. It's like, oh, it's all fun and games until, you know, the kids get involved. Because then you're, you know, you're messing with the future. And that's when he decided to, to make a stand against, against Flat Earth. It, up until that point, I honestly believe, and Flat Earth probably don't believe this, I honestly believed he was going to try to keep this thing as neutral as possible. I've talked with Daniel many times. But then all of a sudden, you know, it got too real for him. It was like, wait a minute. This flat, you know, it, and seriously, it's true. I mean, Flat Earth is everywhere. I mean, it's, it's, it's a paradigm. And it's not, it's not going away. In fact, it just keeps getting bigger, which was what National Geographic was worried about. So he tweaked it. You know, he went after um, Bob as best he could. He went after Jaron as best he could. There really wasn't much he could do with me because I wasn't doing any experiments. Uh, and then Patricia, not much he could do there. And Chris Pontius, not much he could do there. And Nathan Thompson spun him the way he could. So, but it's still, I still think it backfired. For me, it's still a Trojan horse, which is, because I've been in the audience many times with this film being played and they it puts the seed in people's heads uh yeah by the end it's tweaked and and you're you have real doubts in the flat earthers but at the same time it's still in your head by daniel made the mistake in that he made the jaron experiment at the end meaning uh by the time you got there you know you're that's the, literally the end of the film you're 99 minutes into the film and he throws that at you by then you've been so flat smacked that you don't you can't pull back entirely and so yeah, it, it, it'll be fine. You know, nobody's going to quit Flat Earth over this. And there'll be other documentaries in the future, to be sure. Uh, but I don't see it as a, as a negative. I mean, you know, you know, the old saying, any publicity. Yeah, what you're saying, you know, summarize it sounds like at least getting the seed of, you know, getting, getting sure. people to question. Yeah, I mean, I can't. The, yeah, I I've gotten so I, many, so many emails from people just this last week. I saw your thing on Netflix. I saw your thing on Netflix. I have questions. I have questions. It's like, yep, keep them coming. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and I did notice a little bit of manipulation in the documentary. The way the, the, it was like the lighting and like the backdrop for the subject matter experts. They really, they, re they really made the, you know, I think they were some were scientists and right. they really made them. Yeah. Oh, they're they're very credible. Yeah. You know, versus the others. But yeah. I, I did see that a little bit of manipulation there, and that's just you know. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Again, we but, um, we're not loved in the media world. We're not, and uh, I feel I don't. <laughs> I don't feel too bad because he, Daniel's a scientific mind and, and that's fine. But at the same time, he decided to make it and, you know, I believe everything for a reason. So, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes from here. But right now it's doing really well. And, you know, um, I mentioned Eddie Bravo. Are you familiar with Eddie Bravo? Uh, of course. He's a, a yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a flat earther. Um, have you ever connected with him? Has he ever reached out to you? We wrote once, but it was very brief. Uh, Eddie Bravo is an Eric DeBay guy. He, Eric got to him first and, uh, you know, if Eric gets to you first, basically you're only going to talk to Eric because Eric will say nobody else can be trusted, which is fine. You know, it's divisive, but whatever, at least Eddie's on flat earth side, but Eddie's great. I, I love his conviction and I love that he can go up against Joe Rogan and some other celebrities. He's not shy about bringing it up and good for him. He's really great. I'd love to talk to him one day, but again, you know, Eric taints things and it's like, that's fine. Awesome. Hey, Mark. Well, I think I have all my questions answered. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.